Welcome along to the Coaching Corner. Today's episode is uh, based on ultrasound assessment of proximal DVT. I'm your host, Sue Ann Pascoe. If you haven't yet done so, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for all the ultrasound educators out there, sign up to our Facebook community um, called the POCUS Educators and Seed Support Network. We post up articles and have conversations in there that can help with your teaching. I wanted to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Um, it'll be available on our website in the next few days, along with all our previous episodes of the Coaching Corner, under the recess, resources tab on the homepage at ultrasoundtraining.com.au. Feel free to ask questions along the way. If you'd rather ask questions offline, let me know and we can come back to them at the end of the session. Now, I'd love for you all to just mute yourselves if you haven't done so already, and uh, we'll make a start. So today we are looking at ultrasound assessment of proximal DVT. An unrecognized or an untreated deep vein thrombosis in the lower extremities is a major concern because a clot can dislodge and lead to pulmonary embolism and hemodynamic instability. Point of care ultrasound compression with compression is a quick and non-invasive way to assess for DVT and it has a very high sensitivity and specificity so you can determine whether anticoagulant therapy is necessary. In this episode of the Coaching Corner we're going to look at how to perform the DVT ultrasound examination of the legs in a step-by-step -step fashion. To begin with we're going to start by refreshing the anatomy. So deep veins are always paired with an artery. So make sure you can see the relevant artery to know that you're in the deep system. The superficial veins kind of hang out on their own. So you want to be able to see that artery right alongside the vein to know that you're in the deep venous system. The common femoral vein can be identified proximal to the saphenofemoral junction. And so I use that saphenofemoral junction as a landmark to be able to find my spot and as a good place to start above the saphenofemoral junction is the common femoral vein, below it is the femoral vein. Now I'm going to just address a uh, problem that we have with the nomenclature and when we're describing deep vein thrombosis and the ultrasound exam. Formerly we used to talk about the superficial femoral vein. And that's because the common femoral vein divides into a deep femoral vein and a superficial femoral vein. The problem with that is that when people are reporting that there's a superficial vein, femoral vein thrombosis, it can be mistaken for believing that it's in the superficial system and then that potential clot is left untreated. So there was a study done by Thayagaraja and Apologies if that pronunciation is um, poor. And there's even a longer name of another uh, chap that studied it with him. They had a look at um, a lot of junior clinicians and 75% of junior clinicians believed that the superficial femoral vein was part of the superficial venous system. And so we've now sort of worked our way towards calling it the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein so that we can avoid that confusion around mistakenly saying superficial femoral vein and then believing that it's in the superficial femoral system. So the common femoral vein divides into the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein and we track that all the way down to the about the knee and just above the knee crease it passes through the adductor canal and as it does so we go from the artery on the bottom above the knee and as it passes through the adductor canal now the artery the you know the vein on the bottom above the knee as it passes through the canal now the vein is on top and you can remember this because you think about pop on top um, so in the popliteal fossa the popliteal vein sits on top of the artery and as we track it further down the leg we can see that then trifurcating into the calf veins, the anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and the perineal vein. So let's have a look at the difference between what an artery looks like and what a vein looks like on ultrasound. They kind of look similar, same, same, but different. There are distinct differences between the arteries and the veins. So an artery is not readily compressible. 
Now, peripherally, if you push hard enough, you will be able to compress it, uh, but not easily compressible. Arteries have thicker walls because they're comprised of three layers. And an artery will be pulsatile. If you turn the colour on or listen to the blood flow, it will show pulsatility. Veins, on the other hand, are way more compressible and it doesn't take a whole lot of push to be able to get those veins to compress. They are very thin walled and they are non-pulsatile. In fact, the veins should show phasic respiratory variation. So as the patient breathes in and out, you will hear a difference in the phasic flow of the vessel. And if you get them to wriggle their toes, you can force the blood back up the leg and you can hear that or see that as well on colour and spectral Doppler. If we have a look at this study here, you can see the artery left of screen is not compressible. You see it's slightly deform a little there, but the vein with the same amount of pressure will compress quite easily and will wink at you and the walls will kiss each other when you push on it. So in preparing for the examination, we want to think about the three Ps. We're going to choose the right probe for the job. We want to make sure we have the right preset selected on our machine. And we're going to think about the patient positioning and enter the patient details. Now, if you have an average size patient, your first go-to probe will be one of the lower frequency linear probes. If you're in the luxury of having more than one linear probe on your machine, you aim for the lower one. Because as we uh, study down the leg and get towards the middle of the thigh and where the vessels go quite deep, that lower frequency is going to help you penetrate a lot further than if you have a higher frequency probe. So conventionally, I'm using something in the order of a 10 to 5 megahertz or a 12 to 4 megahertz probe. I want to choose a vascular or a venous preset. Now, what happens in the background of the machine is that it slightly tweaks the gain and the dynamic range so that we can enhance the walls of the vessel being white and the lumen of the vessel being black. The other changes that it makes in the background there is that it will uh, make the color parameters much more sensitive to the low flow that we see in the venous system. When we're using a linear probe, you will see that the field of view is quite rectangular uh, some machines allow you to do an extended field of view and give you a trapezoid look, but I tend to keep mine as much as possible in this linear field of view in the rectangular shape. Now, if you have a larger patient or someone with a Demetus legs, you may need to use a curved probe. And once again, we'll choose a venous preset if it's available, but a lot of machines don't have a venous preset on their, on their curved probe, in which case you can use an abdominal preset. Now, if you use an abdominal preset, you might like to fiddle with things like the dynamic range. You might like to adjust the depth because it's been set to look at the liver and set for a much deeper um, field of inquiry. So we wanna adjust the depth. And what I try to do here is to make my curved array and the sector field of view look as much like a linear probe as I can so that I, so that I don't get lost. Now let's have a look at this. When I first put on the curved probe here, you can see the vessels here. They're very small and the depth is set at something like yeah. 17 centimeters. Yeah. And so what we can see... What we can see here is the femoral bone as well as all the musculature in the leg. And so it can be quite overwhelming. There's a whole lot more information here and it can be quite confusing. The vessels are much smaller relative to the size of the field of view. And so it's easy to get lost and to not know where anything is. Now, if we compare that there with the linear probe, where the depth is set at about four or five centimetres and those vessels seem to be quite obvious. So what I do is make my curved probe as much as possible look like a linear. So the first thing to do is bring your depth up. And if you have it available on your system, I also use the sector width and I narrow the sector width so that it looks more linear and I don't have as much information coming at me from the muscles and all the other things in the leg. And you can see in this picture with the adjusted sector width, it makes it much more obvious to see those vessels sitting uh, in the leg there. 
Now, the thing with the adjusted sector width, the benefit of that, if you have it available on your system, instead of having the regulation sort of, and I don't know how many lines, but let's say there's 100 lines of sight for the normal sector width. When you narrow the sector width, you now have 100 lines of sight for a much narrower region. And so it gives you much better detail of the vessels as well. So you get the advantage of having the depth penetration available with the lower frequency of the curve probe and the resolution because we can narrow our sector width. That gives us much better definition of the vessels. Lastly, we're going to think about how we're positioning the patient. So what you want to try to do here is elevate the head of the patient at least 30 to 45 degrees. Now what this does is help cool the blood in the veins of the lower extremities and helps them to dilate a little bit to make them much more visible on the ultrasound. We can also externally rotate the patient's leg and sort of use a frog's leg position. Now the benefit of this position is that we can go from the groin all the way down to the knee and we can look behind the knee in the popliteal fossa without having to move the patient around too much. Now sometimes I'll get the patient to lie very slightly towards the side I roll on their side just a little bit and towards the side that we're examining just to help get behind the knee in that popliteal uh, fossa region. But having the patient sitting up and having the leg externally rotated means that we can do all of the uh, scan from the one scanning position. Now, for some patients, you may want to put a pillow under the knee to support their leg. That can help just steady everything, especially as you're going to be pushing on their leg a little bit. Now, let's have a look at the sonographic technique. There are a number of studies done and a number of ways to uh, do an ultrasound exam of the extremities looking for TVT. And there is common um, nomenclature of a two-point study or a three-point study. And the thing that I find really confusing, and I got myself all confused all over again today, the name two-point leg ultrasound or three-point leg ultrasound exam infers that you are just putting the probe on in two points and looking for clot in those two points. But as you read the detail of these studies, they're actually extending the exam over a two-point region, if you like. And so the two-point ultrasound exam has you looking at the common femoral vein and a little bit of the proximal greater saphenous vein and you extend your exam a little bit here to also include the proximal femoral vein and also then looking behind the knee. The three-point exam, as you can see in the illustration here, also includes a section in the middle of the leg looking at the femoral vein. And then there's the way that we prefer to do it and the technique that I'm going to describe, which is starting at the groin crease and going from the common femoral vein and just doing compression ultrasound testing, going the whole way down the femoral vein, looking at the popliteal and extending it to the proximal calf veins. The thing here is with the two-point um, study and the three-point study, there's reasonable sensitivity. But in reality, if you're extending it over a three-point region rather than just three points, it doesn't actually take that much longer. And I did an example in the videos coming up shortly where I went from the common femoral vein up about a couple of inches above the groin crease and then went all tracked all the way down to the knee and then looked behind. So in two video clips, the first one took about 28 seconds and the second one was 15 seconds. And so in 45 seconds, I had done a hip to a groin to knee ultrasound exam looking for DVT. Now, the patient was very normal and I'm very experienced. But I think the point here that I'm trying to make here is that with a little bit of practice, it's very easy to do this exam just with compression ultrasound and to track the vessels down. And that way you're not missing any little bits because you don't know where that little clot's going to lodge. It's all good and well if it's backed up for ages, but sometimes it starts as just a little bit of a clot and you don't want those ones to break off. So it's easy enough to scan from the groin to the knee and down to the proximal calf veins in under five minutes with just a little bit of practice. So this is how I go about doing it. I start by finding the saphenofemoral junction. Now, if you put the probe on the patient, the groin crease, 
Now you need to get their knickers up out of the road a little bit, but if you put the patient uh, the probe on the patient at the groin crease, you're pretty much at the saphenofemoral junction. And I just track up and down a little here to find that saphenofemoral junction. I then move my probe up as far as we can go to look at the common femoral vein. And then I start my compression testing and track the common femoral vein all the way back down to the saphenal femoral junction. And then I continue on down the leg, looking at the greater saphenous vein and the femoral vein. We then look behind the knee. And again, I start at the knee crease because it's a good reference point. I move my probe and track the vessel north until I have overlap from what I've completed from that uh, first pass on the inside of the leg. And then I start my compressions and I track that vessel down until I see the branch and the trifurcation of the popliteal vein. So when we start, we put our probe in the patient's groin and we're just tracking up and down here a little to see where the saphenofemoral junction is. Now in this example, you can see the Mickey Mouse appearance of I'm trying to get my laser pointer working here. You can see the Mickey Mouse appearance here, just up here of the saphenofemoral vein. So anything proximal to that branch is the common femoral vein, and anything distal to that branch is the femoral vein. So I start at the saphenofemoral junction, I then track my way up, and the second step is to scan the common femoral vein looking for DVT. So as you can see here, we've got the common femoral vein and the common femoral artery. And I'm doing, this picture is taken just above the level of the saphenofemoral junction. And we're doing compression testing here to see if the vein winks at me and to make sure that there's no clot holding that vessel open. The next step is the greater saphenous vein. Now there's evidence to suggest that perhaps we should be treating some of the clots that are in the proximal greater saphenous vein. So at the level here, you can see, here's the greater saphenous vein up here. So one of Mickey Mouse's ears is the greater saphenous vein. The other one over here is the femoral artery. And we can see the deep femoral artery just underneath it with the common femoral artery merging into the femoral artery right in the middle there. So we're going to track that greater saphenous vein down the leg a little to make sure that there's no prox the clot proximally in the vein. Now, some people will track this. If I'm in an imaging department, I would track that greater saphenous vein all the way down the leg as far as I can see it. But for a point of care study, I'd probably just go down 10 to 15 centimetres to make sure that there's no clot in that greater saphenous vein. So, what we're doing in that compression test as we're moving along is pushing on the probe and compressing the vessel and I'm moving a couple of centimetres coming down squash, squash, squash and I track the vessel down the leg. Now when I get to about the mid thigh I put my hand under the patient's leg so that I can push the tissue up from underneath. And what that does is bring the tissue closer and the vessels closer to the probe so that I get better resolution of my vessels. And it also makes it easier to apply even compression on the vein. So if we look at the ultrasound image that corresponds to that technique I've just demonstrated, you're walking your way down the leg and every couple of centimetres or so, you're giving it a short, sharp jab to make sure that that, com that vessel collapses completely and that there is no occluding thrombus holding it open. And you can see as we reach the middle part of the leg here, it starts to dive a bit deeper and I'm actually pushing from underneath rather than on top. Step four is to take pictures and uh, evaluate the femoral vein itself. And so as you can see in this image, we have the femoral vessel, the femoral artery, we've got the profunda femoris or the deep femoral artery here. And as we squish, we're making sure that that vessel completely collapses. In this image too, you can also see the collapsing of the greater saphenous vein, just winking at us up here. As we move down the leg, 
the vessel dives a little bit deeper, we have the artery on top and the vein underneath. And you can see it sort of sitting in there in amongst all the muscles. And as we go a little bit further distally, again, it gets a bit deeper, it gets a little harder, but this is where I'm definitely pushing from underneath rather than on top so that I can keep a very even compression on the probe and to bring the vessels closer to the probe to get better resolution. Now that's really, really important and a really helpful tip, particularly in your larger patients. So you can see the, the pushing or the compression is coming from underneath in this example. And so I typically would take three images or three clips here, one proximally, one in the middle of the leg and one distally, but I've examined the whole length of the leg. Here's an, a video showing that compression technique. So I kind of stabilize my hand position with the probe and I use my other hand to lift the leg tissue and the muscle up towards the probe. Now, sometimes you do need to push from the top as well, depending on your patient's leg size, but this really does help in bringing the vessels closer to the image and closer to the probe so that we get better definition. And step five, the final stage, is to look behind the knee. And we're looking at the popliteal vein here and the short saphenous vein. So you can see here, popliteal vein, popliteal artery. We have the short saphenous vein up here. Remember, as the vessels pass through the adductor canal, we go from a superficial to the knee crease and a superficial, a proximal to the, the adductor canal, we have the artery sitting on top, vein underneath. And as it passes through the adductor canal, it turns over and in the popliteal fossa, the vein is on top. Now, one of the most common problems that people have with the popliteal vein, if you're scanning elsewhere in the body, you're used to pushing quite firmly. When you're scanning behind the knee, chances are you've already got too much pressure on it. So you may only see the artery. What I want you to do is to then back off the pressure and consciously back it off so that you can see the vein uh, open up in front of you. The problem with having too much pressure, and we have to use a lot of pressure everywhere else, and we've just been pushing on the thigh and you have to push quite firmly. So it's easy to just um, be completely collapsing the vein because we're being a little bit heavy handed with our probe. So when you're in the popliteal fossa, find your artery and then consciously back off the pressure. And you can remember, as I said before, that the popliteal vein is on top by remembering pop on top. You can see here, as we're compressing, the vein now on top is the one winking at me. And this image is taken at about the knee crease. Probe position is like this. You'll notice here my other hand is resting against the knee and I'm trying to use that as a counterbalance because when you start pushing the patient's knee, it'll creep away from you. So I just stabilise the knee position so that I've got something to push against so that I get good um, compression on the vessels. We then need to track down the leg. So we're going from the popliteal vein here and it's squishing and we track those vessels down the leg again, compressing the veins every centimetre or so until we see it dive deep towards the muscles here. And then it divides into the calf veins, the anterior tibial, perineal and posterior tibial veins. Here's another example as it dives deep into the muscles here. I typically stop at about the top of the belly of the gastroc muscles here for a point of care study. So about this position is far enough to get to that trifurcation. Now, one of the biggest issues when you're doing a DVT scan, I always say that you never know you've missed or found a DVT until you've found your first one. And there's always that doubt in the back of your mind, have I missed something? When you find your first one, you'll be really sure about it. The problem is you're always wondering how much pressure, have I pushed hard enough? Have I missed something? Have I not pushed hard enough? So how do we know how much pressure is enough pressure to be able to rule out a clot and know that the vein should have collapsed? And the guide here is that you should apply pressure until the pulsatile artery compresses slightly. So you can see here the artery just deforms just a little bit. 
If the adjacent veins compress completely, then there is no DVT. And it's really important to use a good compression technique. We want to keep our probe perpendicular to the vessels and apply an even amount of pressure across the whole face of the probe. If you do that, your vein will wink at you in a very symmetrical manner. If we're off axis a little bit or apply the pressure a little bit unevenly on the probe, you can get a false positive result for DVT. And in this example on the right here, you can see I've applied the pressure quite unevenly and this vein is not collapsing completely. Now, this could be because I'm just not pushing hard enough, but in this case, it was because I was really uneven with my probe technique. So you don't want to miss a clot or, or give a patient a clot where they don't have one because you don't have a good compression technique. This is exactly the same patient on the same leg, and it's just about the technique I'm using for compressing that vessel. Now, another problem that can happen, particularly distally from about the mid thigh down to the knee crease, we can get interference and attenuation from the junctions of the muscle bellies and where they come together in the fascia. And that can overshadow our uh, visualization of the vessels. And so what you can do is just move your probe around the leg to a more, a more medial position or come in a little bit from posteriorly. And this is the effect that it'll have. As we slide our probe over, all of a sudden those veins become much more visible. The other tip you can do is to pop the color Doppler on. If you have a vascular preset chosen or a venous preset chosen, it should be optimized for venous blood flow. And what we're looking for here is not whether there's color or not, or whether it's red or blue. I think one of the most frustrating things I find with Doppler is it's color coded red and blue. And we're conditioned to think that that's artery and vein. And that's not the case. The red and blue indicate direction of flow compared to the probe. And so you can see in this example, the two red vessels there are the arteries because they're much more pulsatile, whereas the vein is kind of a bit sluggish or is showing that phasic respiratory variation. Now, in a normal vessel, that colour should fill the vessel all the way to the edges. And if it doesn't fill the vessel all the way to the edges, it may indicate the presence of a clot. So let's now have a look at some deep vein thrombosis pictures. Compression ultrasound is the most accurate non-invasive test for the diagnosis of DVT. The thrombus will appear as a non-compressible segment of the vein. Sometimes you can see an echogenic area within the lumen. And as you can see coming up just here, the clot sneaks in, and then the vein is not as compressible as it was more proximally. Now in acute thrombus, Non-compressibility of the vein might be the only thing that you see, and it may become apparent much a long way before you actually see the echogenic nature of the clot. So fresh clot tends to be hypoechoic. And so the first sign that you'll see is non-compressibility rather than visualization of the clot itself. In that circumstance, you can adjust your gain a little bit to try to see if that and wind it up slightly to see if that helps you visualize the clot. Direct visualization of the clot is a definitive way to detect the DVT. Traditional physical examinations, such as the Homan sign or just looking for a swollen erythematous leg or a calf tenderness, they have sensitivities no better than a coin tossed. Whereas compression ultrasound provides high sensitivity and specificity. There was a study done by Lensing and his colleagues of 220 symptomatic patients that were scanned for DVT with compression ultrasound, and it yielded 100% sensitivity and 99% specificity. They also, another study done by Lockhart and colleagues looked at um, the value of adding color uh, Doppler to the equation to see if that actually helped. And their conclusion was the color Doppler doesn't really improve the accuracy of the scanning. Um, and it does require that you do squeeze the patient's leg or get them to squeeze their toes, which could risk dislodging a clot and maybe cause a pulmonary embolism. 
So the colour Doppler didn't really add too much to the sensitivity and specificity. And so it's used more as a backup rather than the only way to look at it. Now, I always talk about the veins as being a happy vein will wink at you. And you can see here, if it completely collapses and the walls kiss completely, it's not a lazy, sleazy half wink, it's a complete wink. Sad veins with clot in them will stare at you and they don't collapse completely, as you can see in this example here. You can see some compression there, but it doesn't com collapse completely. This doesn't mean my um, thing has just up. It has. Hang on, we have a small technical difficulty here. I just need to, some of my talks have got a lot of videos in them and they get really big and then PowerPoint doesn't like it and chucks a tantrum. So I just need to um, relaunch my talk here. Bear with me for a sec. Does anyone have any questions while we're, while we're waiting? Have you had the experience where you have this during, during a scan? Not that I know about. I'm always really, really worried though. So if you if I see it in B mode um, without the without compression, if you see an echogenic clot, I don't worry about compressing too much. I, I'll leave it leave it alone. Um, I don't know about them. I don't know what anyone else's experience is there. Yes, uh, actually, whenever I identify an echogenic uh, structure inside the lumen, I don't compress again. So no. I continue scanning and I'm moving down until I reach where I'm not able to see them before I compress. With the fear of the risk that when you compress, you can dislodge the clot to move towards the heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen again now? Okay. Cool. Now here's a clot that, and I'm gonna um, give a shout out to pocus101.com here where I've shamefully stolen some images. Unfortunately, my library of images is all in still pictures, um, which was on the, formal ultrasound machines that don't have, a re uh, well, then they didn't have readily available tools to store uh, video clips. So um, I've grabbed this one from POCUS 101. They've got a lovely tutorial on there. This clot scares me. You can see it flapping around in the vessel. And that's certainly one that I would not compress in any way, shape or form. Here's an example of a hypoechoic clot. So it's quite fresh, I would say. You can see a few uh, internal echoes in here. So a little bit of compression here helps you to um, demonstrate that it's not compressing. And in this case, they're pushing hard enough that the artery is collapsing. So it's definitely thrombosed. And that's as much about knowing your anatomy and which one's which. You wouldn't want to mistake that this is the vein on top here because uh, you could say, oh no, everything's normal. Whereas in fact, the artery is on top, the vein underneath and the vein has occlusive thrombus. If you have hypoechoic clot, as I mentioned, just tweak your gain settings, wind them up a little bit, wind them down and see if that helps in visualization of the clot. Here we've got the popliteal vein. So this time the vein is on top, arteries down the bottom. And you can see the artery is collapsing quite easily, but the vein is not. So those two examples demonstrate you've got to know where you are and where you expect the vessels to be to make sure you're identifying the correct vessel as the vein. And in this example, again, another hypoechoic clot just in through here. The other thing you can do, sometimes it really does help to scan in two planes. It might not be so obvious in the short axis. Um, and then in the longitudinal view here, we can start to see uh, some of those internal echoes of the clot. If you're seeing uh, images 
from the formal ultrasound, they will often use dual imaging. And so they split the screen and the convention here is that they illustrate on the left hand side of the picture, the vessel in its relaxed state without compression and on the right hand side of the picture with compression. So in this example, as much as we can see a bit of hypoechoic material here, as we compress the vein, it is not collapsing and completely winking at us. So it illustrates the uh, thrombus in that femoral vein. Again, we can use the colour Doppler. So if there is a thrombus in the vessel, you won't get a Doppler trace from that because the blood is still. And so you'll either see it as a bite taken out where there should be flow and there is none, or just an absence of flow. Remember that the arteries are quite pulsatile and the veins not as pulsatile. So one of the things... I used to try and squeeze the leg, but I found it difficult to juggle. Now I just get my patient to squeeze their toes um, to try to see if I can force some blood up. Um, again, if you're highly suspicious of a clot, I'd be very hesitant doing that because you don't want to dislodge a uh, thrombus and send it towards the heart. Here's an example of color Doppler in the longitudinal scan plane. And here's the vein underneath here. And you can see that there is partial obstruction. We are getting some blood flow through this vessel. So it's non-occlusive clot. Now there are a number of things that can give us a false positive. Superficial thrombophlebitis, Baker's cysts, lymph nodes, and pseudoaneurysms. So let's have a look at these. In superficial thrombophlebitis, it's just really important that you understand your anatomy. The superficial veins are not paired with an artery, so that's one indicator that you're in the wrong spot. They're also quite superficial, naturally, as it is described, and they sit above the fascia for the muscles. And so you can see here, here are some uh, superficial veins that do have clot in it. Now I'll leave it up to you guys doing the doctoring on how you treat these and stuff, or even if you need to. But um, the superficial veins sit more superficially, they're not paired with an artery. And so knowing your anatomy here will help you avoid this mistake. A Baker's cyst, here's another cause of calf vein that can mimic DVT symptoms and swelling of the leg. Baker's cysts are large hypoechoic cystic structures that sit in the region behind the medial knee. This happens when the knee produces too much synovial fluid, resulting in a buildup of fluid in the area just behind in the popliteal fossa there, affectionately known as a Baker's cyst. This one here is intact, but sometimes they can be partially ruptured. And so you get some internal debris in them and they can mimic what a clot might look like. The key thing here to try to determine whether this is a cyst or whether, whether it's the vessel and a thrombus in the deep vein, I mean, the size of this one gives it away as well, but you can put the colour Doppler on. Now, a Baker's cyst is synovial fluid. There shouldn't be any vascularity in a Baker's cyst, whereas if it's in the vessel itself, you should see it sitting next to the artery and see the uh, Doppler flow in the artery. The other thing with your Baker's cyst is they often have a telltale comma-like projection, as you can sort of see over here, like a speech bubble. And you have this sort of extension of the cyst going in down between the muscles there and communicating with the joint. And if you trace that sort of tail of the, of the cyst, you can trace it to the joint and that can help you decide what's what. Now, lymph nodes, I think everyone would agree here that this looks very similar to some of the images that we've been looking at and could be mistaken for a thrombus. We have the vessels here. We also have this very round structure with internal echoes. Now, the key to identifying a lymph node is that if you turn into the other plane, it will still stay a round shape, whereas a vessel will go from round to a tube-like structure. And so that's the only way to be sure here, apart from knowing your anatomy, but you need to turn into planes. Lymph nodes typically have an echogenic hilum and a hypoechoic um, parenchyma. They can sometimes look like mini, mini kidneys or mini clouds, but when we turn into the opposite plane or the orthogonal plane, it will still stay round, and that's what helps us identify them as lymph nodes. 
And the last one we spoke about was a pseudo aneurysm. I think a good clinical history is the most important factor here. If the patient's had an angiogram, then you need to be on the lookout for a pseudo aneurysm. But I'm not sure what the incidence is of just incidental aneurysms for someone who hasn't had some sort of invasive procedure. Now, in this example, we can see the artery and the tract feeding into the aneurysm here. And the pseudo aneurysms, when you put color on, they just demonstrate that classic sort of yin yang sign with a red and blue color flow. It's also good to try to track that uh, channel from the uh, artery. Uh, and this is where you end up putting a lot of pressure on to see if it is collapsible and if you can stop the blood flow. Now, another potential complication is that some patients have anomalous anatomy that doesn't line up with the textbook description of what anatomy should be of the leg veins and leg arteries. Duplication of the femoral vessels is reasonably common. A recent meta-analysis was done using 11 different studies. So they analyzed over 3,600 legs and it showed a prevalence of duplication of the femoral vein of almost 20%. So one in five people having duplication of the femoral vessels. And so this is where you can have false negatives. So, you know, if one vessel collapses, you can think that this patient doesn't have a clot, but if you've missed the duplicated vessel where there's a clot, you're potentially missing complications that might arise for this patient and exposing them to the risk of embolus or post-thrombotic syndrome, and in the worst case scenario, death. In this example, version of vein two in the image on the right completely collapses and disappears, whereas vein one doesn't. So here we have vein one, the artery, vein two. Here we have vein one with the thrombus, artery. Vein two here completely collapses. So be aware of a duplication of the femoral vessels. And another thing that commonly presents um, and a common finding that we see with DVT exams is cellulitis. The risk of DVT in patients with cellulitis is pretty low compared to the average risk of patients referred for compression ultrasound. So Gunderson and his colleagues did a meta-analysis study looking at the risk of DVT in patients with cellulitis and eris erysipelas, I don't know if I hash that too, um, they looked at 10, uh, 1,054 patients and in total there were 18 DVTs. And what they found that the, was that the incidence rate of having cellulitis in conjunction with a DVT was around the 2% um, or 2 to 3% with really high confidence intervals at 95% and above. So whilst it might present clinically similar to DVT, on ultrasound, you see this classic sort of cobblestone appearance. And the challenge when we're scanning someone with a cellulitic leg is there's a lot more tissue, fluid in the tissues and lots more interfaces. And so the sound attenuates quite badly and makes it, it makes it really difficult to see the deep vessels below the cellulitis. So... Use your curved probe for increased penetration. Here's an example, like we've done the panoramic view on the fancy machines here to show that that extends over quite a bit of tissue. And we've got that classic cobblestoning appearance here. So a lot of information for you. So let's wrap up. In summary, compression ultrasound is a very sensitive and specific test that we can use to evaluate for DVT. Direct visualization of the vessels and the thrombus in the vessel and non-compressibility is indicative of DVT. You need to track the length of the vessels, compressing with a short, sharp jab to see the walls of the vein kiss or wink at you every centimeter or so. We're going to start by identifying the saphenofemoral junction as our starting landmark. Anything proximal to this is the common femoral vein, we're going to track that up as high as we can. And then we're going to start compressing and work our way back down to the saphenofemoral junction. So we've evaluated in step two, the common femoral vein. Once we reach that saphenofemoral junction, we know that anything distal to that is either the long saph or the greater saphenous vein, 
or the femoral vein. And so we need to, in step three, extend our exam down the great saphenous vein for 10, 15 centimetres or so, and then come back up to that junction and then follow the femoral vein down. We're going to follow it all the way from the saphenofemoral junction down as far as we can close to the knee crest. That's when we change our approach and we come in from behind the knee and we look from the knee crease. Again, we're going to start by tracking that vessel up to above the knee crease until we get overlap with where we finished off on the downwards run from the femoral vein. And then we're going to compress every couple of centimetres until we get to the calf or the top of the gastroc muscles where we see the trifurcation of the calf veins. So I hope there's some tips and tricks in amongst that that are helpful in your scanning. I'm going to throw it over to you now to see if there are any questions from the audience. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very nice. But uh, I would like to find out whether in, in your own setting, uh, do you often examine the external iliac veins, the common iliac veins, and the inferior vena cava. Because in my in, in my own setting, we do because sometimes they could be clogged up the uh, around in the IVC or in the external iliac vein, or sometimes even low pattern will not go. Uh, it will not be. Um, the vein will be dilated, and you may not find a DVT, but you will find a vein being dilated. And also, we do use um, a pulse wave Doppler to see whether the flow in the vein is it uh, is it phasing with respiration. And sometimes we do a calf compression or ask the patient to take a deep breath in in order to assess the upper part of the veins. So that seems like an easy question. I'm going to answer it two ways. If I'm doing a point of care study, I'm going hip to knee because it's in the emergency room. We're looking out for the big things. If, if I were to see thrombus proximally in the common femoral vein, I would then track it up until I could find the end. Now, that's from a point of care perspective. The way I do a DVT study as a sonographer in the imaging department is quite different to this. And in that circumstance, yes, you would extend it to the external iliac and IVC if you saw proximal thrombus and you'd be sure to continue up. We also look below the knees and interrogate the calf veins. And when I look at the calf veins, I get the patient sitting up on the edge of the bed with their legs hanging down. Again, that's just to help me pull the blood in the vessels so that they're bigger and so that I can see them more clearly. And in a formal ultrasound in the imaging department, we have to use colour and we I all, always do look at phasic respiration with spectral Doppler. Now, in the context of a point of care study, a lot of the point of care physicians are not overly familiar with using the spectral Doppler. They haven't had training in it. They can't use it well. It's best for them not to use it. And in that study that I indicated, Use of colour Doppler and then spectral Doppler on top of that didn't actually add too much to the point of care examination. And that's partly because they're more inexperienced operators and they don't know how to use it well. In a formal imaging study, however, yes, I would always do a um, phasic respiration test, common femoral, femoral, and even behind the knee. Um, and then we also extend it looking down in the calf veins as well. I think that's a, a different talk that extends down the leg. Uh, the question on the chat is, will the principle be the same in patients under two years of age, including the newborn? The same principles for assessing DVT are the same anywhere in the body. If I'm looking at thrombus in the R, I'm doing the same technique. Again, this is just about knowing your anatomy, knowing which vessels are deep and superficial, but essentially you're doing the same technique and you're tracking the vessel compressing every centimeter or so or closer if your patient is a little bit smaller. Um, it gets tricky at subclavian because you can't get compression on the subclavian artery because it's protected by the rib cage. 
we can compress in the IVC, definitely. So it's the same principles for investigation. It's just applying them to different anatomy. Does anyone else have any okay. comments, questions? Yes, um, I would like to come in again. Um, is there a way uh, that that from scanning we can uh, uh, that we can determine an old DVT from a from a newly formed DVT? Typically, older DVT can tend to be more echogenic. The fresh ones are hypoechoic. And as they get older and clot and harden, they get a little bit more echogenic. The older DVTs, the longer that they've been there, you'd rely on your clinical history as well. But the longer that they've been there, the more chance there is with treatments and stuff that you can have recanalization of the vein. So sometimes those partially occlusive DVTs that are echogenic might actually be old DVT. But I think that would be... I'd be much more confident about that if I had a good clinical history rather than just looking at the images by themselves. I think that would be a risky proposition. But, yeah, typically newer clot is hypoechoic and as it gets older, it gets a little bit more echogenic. Does anyone have any further questions? Um, I've got one. Is it possible to look at a clot and see whether it's partly embolized already? I mean, does it have a cutoff, for example, as opposed to a taper or is that not a characteristic? I haven't noticed that, no. Right, when they break, do they break? Quite, yeah. I think, again, it comes down to if it's broken off and it's causing havoc, you're going to know clinically and could rely mm. on clinical stuff much more than you could rely on what the ultrasound looks like. No. But anyone who's seen lots of DVTs disagree with that? Uh, no, Sue Ann, I completely agree. And I have seen one break off and they do break off in different ways. Um, and some of them like slice off and some of them cut off e exactly. So, but yeah, you would never rely on that. You need the clinical signs. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you very much for that information on the study relating to cellulitis and the presence of DVT. I was unaware of that uh, very, very low instance and um, that's going to change my clinical practice for sure. Thank you. You know, do you know what, Alison, that is something I've had this theory a long time going that just anecdotally that, uh, you know, what is the incidence? If you have someone with an obviously cellulitic leg and you see cellulitis in the superficial tissues, I personally have not seen coexisting thrombus. And my theory here is, rightly or wrongly, is that there's the, the pressure from the, t the fluid in the tissues actually causes like compression and helps the, the blood to get back so that clot doesn't form. But I actually looked up that question today for this presentation because I have been curious for a long time and this was the impetus for me to actually answer that. And I was uh, quite happy to note that the incidence was low as well. So um, I agree with you. Yeah, anecdotally, anecdotally, I would have been searching for that answer my whole career in frustration. Yes. So um, the research is very welcome, and um, I'd love to actually have the link to the study um, for yeah future education, I guess. Um, but thanks, that's really interesting. I can send it through. Cool. On the, on the other hand, um, sorry, cellulitis is really very common, and so 2% might be a small proportion, but it may be a big number. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Good point. I haven't <laughs> seen it clinically, but... Uh, you know, I, I see it anyway, quite often in my work, yeah. With, with both together? Well, I've never seen it with both, but then again, I haven't looked. Mm. There you go. I, if I was research inclined... I reckon it'd be a good, a good study to do. Mm. Have a look. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, one other concern that um, here in Cameroon, most uh, uh, most of our clinicians will send patients for DVT, and in some of the cases, I see uh, people who have rather right heart failure. And the uh, and the and the venous flow in the lower extremity is poor. 
And, uh, there are people are saying that that one has a high risk of activity, but uh, hello? You're breaking hello? up a little there. Hello? Oh, it is my, yeah, it is my connection, which is not good. My connection is not good. But what I was saying is that uh, sometimes I receive patients for DVT, but uh, and uh, I will discover that it is just right heart failure that has caused the lower extremities to be swollen. Yeah, so, but uh, I'm seeing that uh, the right heart failure uh, will not easily give a DVT, just as cellulitis will do also. I don't know if there are any... Um, I couldn't speak to that myself. I've not done extensive echo. I've done point of care echo. So, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked that up. So that could be your homework, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got yeah, any experience with that? that? Yeah, um, actually most, uh, most of the patients It's a shame the connection's really dodgy there and we, we've lost you again, Henry. All right. Oh, that's a shame. Um, Jeff, do you have any experience with the right heart failure and coexisting DBT? Do you know anything there? No, but I was just thinking about it. When you said that you wondered whether the, the whether cellulitis causes a compressive effect on the veins and reduces the risk of... Um, of DVTs in the lower limb, I just wondered whether the um, edema of right heart failure would do the same. Um, yeah. Why? Why? That's I, that's, that's my um, unscientific thought. Sure. <laughs> that's and what the, I'm my thinking. Other, about. My other thought is that if you've got an inflammatory um, condition in the lower limb, like cellulitis, if anything, I would have thought that would increase the potential. If you've got an ir irritated vein, um, in in you know the perineal or popliteal veins are there. If if there if there's inflammation, I would have actually wondered if that would increase the, the tendency. Um, even and so there are my two thoughts. Would um, would the the pressure effect of cellulitis? How do you compare that to the pressure effect of right heart failure? And then and what's the effect of the inflammatory process? Because you're a bit more hypercoagulable. I would have thought. Well, these I'm are just, questions this, that I Yeah, I'm just brainstorming. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, cool. I'm also just thinking there, um, we, we use preventative compression on legs to try and prevent DVT. Mm. And so when you have cellulitis, it increases the fluid, which acts like a DVT stocking to a certain mm. degree, as does, um, you know, fluid overload from right heart failure. Also, whilst it's not an inflammatory condition, it also increases pressure. That's a good point. So yeah. I, I, I'm a bit, I'm a, I do agree with Sue Ann. I've had the same experience as her, but it's a great research question and definitely um, something to consider. Yeah, I see your point. The analogy with the stocking is a good one. Yeah. All righty. Well. I'd like to thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, if you like this episode, feel free to share it with your colleagues. And once again, if you would like to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll find all our previous topics there, or you can look at them under the resources tab on our homepage at ultrasoundtraining.com.au. If you have any suggestions for topics you would like covered in future episodes, please feel free to get in touch by email or on my socials and we'll see what we can do. I'm looking for a topic for next month. So um, get in touch. Other than that, I thank you all for attending tonight and I'm going to bid you all good night. Or good morning, you. wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Cameroon. Yeah.